Well, good evening, friends. Um, welcome to another uh, broadcast of Crossroads. Um, uh, just a reminder, as we've said last week, we've moved our broadcast now to Monday evenings. And so this is our second time that we are on, on a Monday evening at 8.30. And tonight we, uh, take, we are tackling uh, also a very important topic, which I think is under threat in our time. Uh, biblical manhood and so again tonight with me is Matthew Millers and Colin Wyatt Goodell. Good evening guys, how are you doing? Hey, Good evening, Yaku. Yeah, how's it going? Good. Yeah. Good, man. So yeah, uh, friends, just to remind you before we continue with the show tonight, um, we, we have a Facebook page. Please like our Facebook page if you haven't done so yet. Um, you can just search for a Crossroads. Uh, or you can go to facebook.com forward slash crossroads cape and then you should get there we also have a youtube channel and you should be able to find our youtube channel from our facebook page page we will put links up for that and we'd like to <clears throat> to subscribe to our facebook channel uh, to our youtube channel and also like our facebook page and share it with your friends and and then that way you can also help us to to share the truth and share uh, God's word uh, with your family and friends. So by way of introduction tonight, before we start tackling this topic, uh, you know, our, our postmodern world, in our postmodern world, manhood is undergoing a crisis. Liberals demand gender neutrality. Feminists dem demand absolute equality in all spheres of life. And on the other side, conservatives say, True manhood is found in masculinity. Secular humanist says true manhood is found in money and power. A very famous theologian, Vody Balcom, gives us a very helpful illustration, which he calls the three Bs, ball field, bedroom, and bullfold. He says culture tells us that true manhood is measured how well you are on the sports field, for example, rugby or baseball or whatever, or how good you are in the bedroom, in other words, with sexuality, and how thick is your wallet, for example, money. In other words, what car you drive, where you stay, or where you hang out, who you know. Now, what does the Bible say? Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, but when it comes to the word of God, one thing defines manhood. And it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now, guys, there's an introduction for you. Um, what do you guys think? Let's start talking about biblical manhood. Let's define what biblical manhood is. And then from there on, we'll move on to what it's not. And we'll talk about toxic masculinity. But let's start off. But what does the scripture tell us about biblical manhood? Matt, some thoughts oh, on your uh, side? Oh, Colin, uh, I'll, you jump I'll, in? I'll start, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, well, I think it's, it's quite clear, actually. Uh, you know, from, from the photo we shared today, you know, biblical manhood is, is being a strong bare-knuckled boxer like James L. Sullivan. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, um, no, I don't. I don't see you having a good moustache there, Colin. Uh, no, I, I'm you not know, sure I, if you can grow one. <laughs> I, I see Matt, Matt might do well. <laughs> yeah, Matt, Matt's got a reformer's beard. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm an Arminian. Yeah. But you know, that's <laughs> oftentimes we measure manhood like that, and it's rather unfortunate. You know that quote from Bodhi you mentioned. Um, you know, it's it's very significant because. Oftentimes when we talk about manhood, we want to go straight to outward appearances. You know, you mm. need to be strong. You need to be physical. You need to. And I've heard, I've heard Christian pastors say, like, the measure of a man is, is his beard. Yes. Um, you know, and, you know, men must grow beards and all, all sorts of nonsense like that. And, you know, I just take people to the example of David and Saul. You know, where um, when Saul was chosen as a king, he stood one head height above all the other men. He was the physical specimen. He was the man mm. that everyone could look to and be like, that's the leader we need. Um, when in reality, you know, David 
was the king that they needed. You know, and when God sent Samuel to anoint David, if you remember, Samuel went through all the brothers to little old David. You know, he was like, surely it's this guy. Okay, maybe not this guy. David was ultimately forgotten. But 1 Samuel 16, 7, you know, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, and, and the Bible then goes on to tell us that David was a man after God's own heart. You know, David was a biblical man. And look, David was also, you know, tough and by worldly standards, probably more of a man than most of us today. I, I doubt mm. we could fight lions and bears and stuff. <laughs> but what God was concerned with was David's heart, a heart that seeks mm. after the Lord. You know, if we turn to the Psalms, we can see David's longing for the Lord, longing for the word of the Lord, going to the Lord in prayer. Um, you know, Psalm 73, verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Who ha whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You know, biblically speaking, those are the words of a man. Mm -hmm. Though that, That's where we need to start with this. Men are people who seek after God. Mm -hmm. God has designed men to lead and, and to glorify him in their leading. And so we need to start with that biblical definition of, of God has, has created us and in his image to lead, but ultimately it is to seek after and glorify him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Matt, before you just jump in there, let me just read a verse here from 1 Corinthians uh, 16, verse 13 to 14. It says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Yeah, it's quite the contrast to what we see in the world. Although, uh, I mean, the verse clearly speaks of mm. there's, there's a certain behavior that's like, uh, likened to men being strong, being strong-minded, strong-willed. But we, we need to define strong-minded and strong-willed as well. And that's why I think Paul says here, let all that you do be done in love. You know, it's not a, it's not a selfish, selfish way of, of acting and just doing for your own sake. But, uh, you know, men of faith throughout the Bible, um, in throughout of church history, uh, was not always men who were, uh, I mean, I see, if I look at uh, many of the, stories of the bible and and stories throughout church history it was not the most attractive men that were the strong ones you know uh, we think of even as it's samson how samson fell you know he was a big strong man and how he fell for a woman and there was big men who had strong muscular appearances uh, throughout church history who fell but it was men like paul uh, you know, people were not, you think of Jesus himself, the Bible described Jesus in, in, in Isaiah 53 as someone that was not your, your hunk of the day. And I say that with a lot of respect, but yet Jesus is our perfect example of biblical manhood. Someone who, are, who stood so strong in the face of all evil, who faced Satan and overcame, overcame him, who went to the cross and, 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 you know, so I think in worldly, in a worldly, worldly way, we always think that men with the most attractive appearances, the strongest and the biggest muscles and like body gave us that explanation, you know, you're good in a bedroom. You, you're the, you're the one that people hang around uh, when you're the center of attention. That's how the world look at, at, at strong men. And, and Colin gave very good examples of what it's not. And it's not true. It's not like that. Um, uh, Matthew, do you want to add something there? Yeah, I mean, I actually just want to maybe um, follow on in that sequence of, um, you know, the kings in the Old Testament, you know, from Saul to David, and then we see um, Solomon. And um, near the, the end of David's life, um, uh, he said this to, to Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. He said the following, I am about to go the way of all the earth, be strong and show yourself a man. And what did he say next? Keep the charge of the Lord your God. And this is how, and this is how we keep the charge of the Lord our God, by walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, that you may mm -hmm. prosper in all that you do and whatever you turn. 
Um, no, no, David wasn't the perfect man. We know that he, he fell from grace, um, you know, uh, killed an innocent man. Um, you know, we think of the adultery, uh, sorry, uh, adultery that he had rather with uh, Bathsheba. Uh, so again, he, he wasn't the perfect man, but he, it's amazing how he was a man that uh, was, that had a heart after the Lord. Um, and so in that, we see this charge that he gives to his son. Mm. What's amazing is in Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter 12, um, you know, the book where Solomon really says, you know, I've, I've had it all. I've had, you know, I've, I've had all wisdom. I've had um, everything that a man could ever want, from the riches to enjoyment to pleasure. Um, and he said, really, it's all vanity at the end of the day without the Lord. And in chapter 12, he says, you know, to summate really what life's about for, for the Christian and for the godly man uh, is to fear God and keep his commandments, keep his statutes. Um, so I think, again, re really, a, a man uh, or biblical manhood <clears throat> is really a, a man that is strong, courageous, uh, yet is a man that walks in the way of the Lord. And how do we do that? We need to be men <clears throat> of the book. We, we've spoken about you know, God's word numerous times on this program. Um, and really, biblical manhood starts by someone that's actually a student of the Word of God. And then maybe this to uh, mention, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I think as you mentioned, Yaku, you know, the perfect man, uh, the only perfect man that ever walked the face of this earth. Mm. Uh, and he was selfless. Uh, you know, he uh, led, a, led a life of sacrifice. Uh, and... Um, I think we really need to look at the Lord Jesus Christ himself um, when we want to look at, you know, the embodiment of true masculinity. Hmm. Yeah, I think in these times we live in, you know, with this whole gender wars that we see, it's like every, uh, you know, the world wants gender neutrality. They don't want you to speak about manhood uh, and make that distinction and, 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 and say what, how God created us. And so uh, as, as Christians, we need to find our identity as men and women in how God created us. Uh, I mean, then Genesis 2 verse 24 says, that is why ma a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. And then also in Genesis uh, uh, 1, I think it's 26, 27, round about there, uh, it says God created us, uh, ma like humanity in his image. He created us as man and woman. There's that clear distinctions uh, of, of the genders, you know, manhood and womanhood. And God has made man with certain qualities. The world doesn't like to hear that because they say that there's, there's increasingly, uh, um, uh, 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 um, how can I say it, this, this agenda to break down that identity, that, 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 that distinction between man and woman. And increasingly we see uh, how the world are dressing men up as women. And you must discover your feminine side kind of things that I often hear, you know. And I mean, before we start the show, I showed you a bit some of some of the pictures and I will not show it here tonight. You know, 2020 fashion shows, how, how men dress. You know, it's increasingly this breaking down of the image of manhood in the world. Um, fathers, you know, uh, being a father, being someone who take care of his home, being so, to say you are the breadwinner is offensive. To say a man is a breadwinner of his home and that a, a, a good man is someone who take care of, of his home, protect his family, who protect his children. And it's your, your role, it's your, your role, your um, responsibility. Um, well, the Bible clearly says someone who doesn't take care of his own family is even worse than an unbeliever. And if you speak like that in the world and you elevate that role God has given us as men, which is distinct, there's a distinct role. Um, you increasingly, increasingly come under pressure and we are said, we are, we are told we are chauvinists, but yet that's how God made it. And I think even in the church today and the church's message to outside and inside is we should be strongly so. What has God made us? What is this distinctions? 
what is a what is a what is biblical womanhood? What is biblical manhood? And maybe we can speak a, a bit more about what it's what it is and what it's not. Um, and you know, there's also toxic masculinity. We're not talking about chauvinism. We don't talking about bullying behavior. Uh, those things are there, but that's sinful. That's not how God made it. That's not a biblical man. I mean, there's verses that says, um, I think it's in uh, 1 Peter 3 verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Well, there's clearly, again, a distinction here that women, in a certain way, is the weaker vessel. But that's not a derogatory term. It doesn't mean women are weaklings. It's just our makeup is different. Women are more emotional. They can get easily hurt. Men are there to protect their wives. And they need to live with their wives in a way that treat them as those who are like that. Guys, something to add there? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, if I can quickly jump in there. Um, just because I, I spend a lot of time chatting to some young single men. And I know often when they see these passages like the one you read, you know, husbands treat your wife, protect your wife. She's the weaker mm. vessel. You know, young single men almost breathe a sigh of relief and go, I'm not married yet. <laughs> you know, and, and my response to that is, is no, be a man. Like, mm. you know, the motif here is, is that God has designed things in a specific order. There are men and they serve a role in society and women, they serve a role in society. And, and, a, and a particular motif we see in all throughout scriptures is that the stronger vessels need to take care of and protect the weaker vessels. Mm. So husbands need to take care of their wife, wives. Uh, that, that's mandated clearly in scripture. Mm. But the family is the closest concentric circle. Single men still have a responsibility and duty to look out for and care for mm. those who are weaker and downtrodden in society. Mm. And this is not like, oh, it's a secondary. This is something you as a man are responsible for. And so men should look at these commands from husbands to wives and not see them as, oh, I'm hopefully going to be this man one day in the future. Mm. This is a mandate. This is a... Um, this is a, a, a place you want to strive to be now before you're married. You want to be this man before you meet a wife. Mm. Um, you know, and it's the same thing, I, I think. And I find this, you know, we often cite this verse to show how wives should submit to their husbands in complementarianism. But I actually think this is a verse that is very, very difficult for men. Um, it's in Ephesians 5, mm. you know, and th there again, we see God has designed things with a specific order. Men have a role and women have a role. Let's not muddy the waters. Mm. Um, there. You. you know, if you look at Old Testament law, God went to great lengths to defining distinctions between men and women. And I'm not saying we must keep every letter of Old Testament law. You know, there are some people who say ladies or girls can't wear pants because they are men's items of clothing. And they mm. cite Old Testament law. But the heart of this is that there are things for men and there are things for women. But, but mm. just listen to 5 verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, so that he might be present, he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Now, obviously, we cannot present our wives to God spotless mm. and holy without blemish because w that's a sacrifice beyond um, what we are able to give. But the point is, is that Christ served the church, served sacrificially. He gave himself up. And likewise, husbands and men should be willing to serve to that degree. You know, we should be man enough to say, I'm going to serve. I'm going to sacrifice what I want. I'm going to sacrifice that round of golf I so love to spend time reading stories to my small children. Hmm. I'm going to put aside my things and seek the good of, of others. I'm going to serve other people. I'm going to serve my wife, serve my children, serve my community, serve my church. You know, and, and I think that's a key aspect for, for manhood. It's, it's yeah. Men 
have a distinct role of leading, but that that leading is a is a servant-hearted leading, mm. how Christ led. Mm. Um, you know, and we should we should be willing to take a stand on that. I, I think that this is something where, when the world wants to blur the lines here and say, "Men, you shouldn't lead like that," you know, we shouldn't have these roles in the church. This is something where we need to to take a stand. We need to say uh, that is a, an abominable idea. This idea that that men and women are the same in all of these areas. Men are meant to lead and protect. The Bible has designed these roles to be that. Mm. So men of all walks of life should be striving towards that. Um, Matt, before you jump in, I just want to touch some, show briefly on what Colin was saying about uh, unmarried men saying, but when you read that verse that they are exempt, you know, I, when I, when I, when I grew up as a boy, um, I was taught that as a society, we as men honor the women as a society. And even as an uh, even as an unmarried young man, a young boy, I was taught to treat the women in in society a certain way. So young men is not exempt from this. How we should work with women, treating them as the weaker vessel, or you know, and the, and the weaker vessel again. I want to say it's not meaning a derogatory term. It just means there's there's different roles, and women are a different makeup. You know, I was taught when you get to a door. Women will walk first. You honor them in that way. Uh, I was taught how we sp you speak to women in general. And I see these things in our society today is completely breaking down. I don't see young men being taught in, in any more how to treat women. And, and I just see, in many cases, young men mistreating or the way they speak to women mm -hmm. or act towards women is not like that, uh, uh, that verse is, for example, indicating. Yes, Matt, sorry. No, no. Um... I think um, Colin made some really good points, um, and, and Yaku, just you know, your follow-up. Yeah, maybe just to, to add a couple of things. Um, and I, I think in this topic, there, there's so much to to speak on, and, and and we can go in different directions. But maybe you know, one of the things I know you guys were chatting a lot about, you know, ma the man's role, um, you know, in connection with the woman. Um, but I just want to maybe just touch on just the man independence of the woman and just for, for a second. And I think a lot of the problems, you know, even speaking to many younger men, even in, I'm, I'm not referring to unbelieving men, I'm talking about believers, you know, mm. men in their 20s, you know, approaching their 30s. Mm. I, I sadly see too many men uh, acting like boys still. Mm. Um, there's sadly a maturity uh, issue, um, you know, where where men still, you know, almost have a desire still to live at home in their thirties, you know, and I'm, and I, you know, this, uh, maybe there's nuances here, but the point here is that I think often, you know, men have a tendency, you know, I think our sinful tendency is often to be lazy. Uh, you know, men uh, can take advantage of that, you know, yeah. you know, the, the whole, the whole adage of, you know, m you know, the boy is, is, you know, men are mommy's boys in a sense. And, yeah. and what, what I'm saying is, Often, I think a lot of the problems we find in uh, the role of the man and even in the household when they get married is a, a, an issue of maturity, of actually not taking ownership of what God has given to them. Um, again, let's just think about the role of the church and, and men in church, um, whether it's in leadership roles, whether it's just serving uh, in their local church. Again, and I know we we're chatting about this, you know, even off, off air, and we, we often speak about these things. Where are the men serving in the local body? Mm -hmm. Often, again, it's the women at the prayer meetings. It's it's the woman in the home that's saying to the husband, you know, let, we need to do Bible time mm -hmm. with the children. Uh, we need to to pray with the kids. Um, and sadly, men um, are not stepping up to the plate. Uh, mm -hmm. Men are negating again their God-given role. And women, again, because, again, if you just think about what, what a, a woman will then do, that, they will inherently pick up that slack and step into that leadership role where they, they shouldn't. And, and again, I think the majority of the blame is actually, again, with the man in this. Um, and again, I think even with church leadership, we, 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 I know, we, you know when you speak about you know, uh, church leadership as a whole, I think often what we're seeing even over the last you know, number of years in church circles is that 
men unfortunately haven't actually stepped up to the plates and women are mm -hmm. taking those roles and I, there's obviously a lot we could chat around that but i, I think the point here is i, I really think um you know men and I'm, I'm referring to men in churches i'm talking about christian men here again uh, uh really i think need to step up to the plate they need to mm -hmm. act like men and stop acting like boys uh again you know put the playstation down and they get to work so mm -hmm. and again and i'm not bashing the playstation you know i think you guys know what i'm yeah. saying so the point is we, we we we're not taking life seriously we're not being sober-minded uh when it comes to our duties uh, and roles and our responsibilities that again that, that christ has, has given to us yeah matt i think you make a very important point i mean we we live in a society and i've looked at the stats uh, a while ago i don't have the exact stats here tonight but the divorce rate among christians is big uh, i think it's around about 50 percent and even more uh, the divorce rate amongst in, in in general in our society is big uh, the second the, another growing tendency is not to get married just to live together increasingly that's going to happen so in, increasingly, we, we, we see this whole thing of family where, you, where the, there's a father role, a father figure who, who shows to his boys or even to his girls because a girl is seeing her future husband in a way in her father. The way her father is treating her, respecting her already as a girl, honoring her already as a weaker vessel. Showing that example to her, the way he treat her, and knowing that she's the weaker part, you need to be sensitive to her, how he respect her as a woman, and she sees that, that is how she will picture her future, her future husband. The same for the boys. The, the boys need to be discipled. The father needs to take his boy where he goes, in, 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 he, in, in the way he grow up. Teach him to be to have ambition. Treat him to have a drive. Teach him to 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 know that one day you will have a home and you will be a husband and a father of your own home. You're going to have girls and or boys, and you need to treat, train, and disciple them again. And that that because of divorce rate, people just living together, and the whole pressure of society on on gender and manhood. There's a complete vacuum that's been created more and more, and boys grow up with others. Um, you know, I, I, I remember when I was, was young, and um, I mean, although I come from a broken home, society was in general geared towards raising men as men in my time. I learned, although I came from a broken home and I had an absent father, I grew up in society where we, my teachers at school taught me what is a man. My, 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 my friend's fathers taught me what is a man. So you, you had an integrated society where this role of what a man is and a biblical man is, is being taken up, not just by the, the family, but even by in the school, you know. Um, uh, um, when I went to the army, you know, um, and I, I, I learned independence. I, I, I learned what it means to be a man. Society was just in general geared towards that today that the, the structures has completely be destroyed in a, in, a, in, a, in a big way many young men grew up i don't think they have the, this identity what is it what is that what is what does it mean for you to be a man this whole idea that you are responsible i mean i grew up with the responsibility i knew i'll have to leave home one day put up a home get married take care of my family Many young men, I think, today just grow up and think of how they're going to spend their money on themselves and things after school, you know, um, buying a nice car, travel. Uh, no, no, marriage is for much later, you know. And if you think of, of God's calling and his creation order, which still stands, our calling is to get married, to, to, to procreate, to fill the earth and to be fathers of a home. Um, society works against that and I think um, boys who don't grow up with a father anymore who show them that way you know um, Colin something to add there yes yeah no I think that I think there is there is there's that absence of that like father figure a lot in our society nowadays you know if you, if you turn to Proverbs you often see this um, imploring of a father to a son, my son, hear my voice, my son, um, you know, accept my words that are the years of my life, that, that your years may be many. 
Um, you know, there's, there's a whole lot. Proverbs 4 is a very well-known passage on that. Um, but, you know, also coming back to something Matt said that I think is um, significant, is like we also, what we seem to be doing in society is, is raising people who are lazy, raising people who, and it's, it comes from this idea of autonomy, of mm. like, really, you must do what you want for your life now. The purpose of your existence is to enjoy your life now. now. Now, I'm not saying don't enjoy your life. There are times for all of that. But that has to fit in the context of you are a creature who has been cre created by God to fulfill and serve his purposes. And your enjoyment comes out of doing that primarily. You know, and God created man and said, till the earth, work, you know, um, if we just look at the Proverbs, I mean, there's so many passages in there, but uh, Proverbs 12, 27, a lazy man does not roast his prey, but the precious possession of a man is diligence. You know, we are to be diligent with what we have been given, you know, and, and it is time that we, we, we speak to young men. And, and I think even, even men at a young age, um, we speak to them and we say, um, you know, be a man, you know, gird up your loins, face the consequences of your actions. Um, and I think just on a side note, serving in a church, men, are you discipling other men? You know, mm. we speak of fatherlessness in society, but there, I, I see so many godly men in the church and it breaks my heart that, that so many of them just come on a Sunday and leave on a Sunday. And, and you, have, you often have young men who are wayward and hungry for the word. And nobody there to disciple them. Nobody there to walk alongside these young men. Like, where are the men? You know, and, and if you're watching this, whether it's live or later, if, if you're in, in our church or any other church, like, think on the words of these things. And if they prick your conscience, don't let it rest. You know, you know we, we need to start taking responsibility for, for, the, um, for what God has decreed us to do. We need to be diligent with what he has given us. We need to serve and be faithful. You know, um, um, I think it's quite important what you said there, Colin, about the church and how we behave in the church. And I think of what Paul uh, wrote in Titus 2 when he spoke to women. And clearly that was not just a woman. That pattern exists for men as well. He said the older women should teach the young, younger women how to love their husbands and how to take care of their children and how to you know, to be women in the home or in society. So there was a clear pattern in the early church where it's not just in, in, even in the family, it was in the whole church. Older women taught the younger women in the church. So you could see how you can have this picture of an older woman regularly rallying around a younger woman to teach them, even the, the unmarried young women, how to be women one day for their own home and for their own husbands. And likewise, Old, you know, senior men. Um, I know of some some men um, that uh, I mean, you guys know even in your church, and I'm not going to mention names, but who, who reach out to the young men and invite them and walk a path with them, uh, because they are even even the elderly that can uh, elderly in a in a church setting can train the young men. What does it mean to be a man, and also be leaders in the church? And uh, I just want to point out a few things before um, Colin, maybe or Ahmed also jump in. Um, you know what. What, some 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 few highlighting points about biblical manhood. Um, so, I think the first important thing that we need to say is that, uh, that the the most important thing for a biblical man is someone who know God, who has a relationship with God, and who fears the Lord. That's that's the fundamental thing. Um, and the second thing is um, we've touched on those things, and I just want to sum around them. Biblical manhood includes respons the responsibility take care and protect one's family okay um and you and and also i think biblical manhood also is about your role in the church and within marriage and and i think it's very important today in the church we see a really a lack of men men leaders who take who take at the forefront who leads at the forefront um, who leads by example who leads by servanthood for other men to follow for boys to see an example how we as men function in the church, how we as men function in society. Um, 
Yeah, and I think mm. it's important that we say uh, a, a biblical man is someone who knows how to treat a woman, how to respect him, how not to, to, to control them. And biblical manhood doesn't mean controlling women. It doesn't mean a Hitler style, a dictatorship in your marriage, in church. Women must just be shut out and keep quiet and, and look down. on. That's not a biblical man. In fact, biblical manhood is about servanthood. I mean, if we think of what Jesus said, if, you, if we should love our wives like he loved his church. Now, brothers, that's a massive charge. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm falling massively short of that charge. And we should lay our lives down for our women. And we should honor them and treat them and respect them and love them. Biblical manhood is not someone who abuses his uh, traits, his characteristics and his own special traits. Um, the stronger one who forces himself down on women, sexually abuses them, uh, verbally abuses them, walking over them. That's not a biblical man. In fact, that's toxic masculinity, not a biblical man. Matt, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, um, I know time's getting away from us again. And mm. I know there's a question that we, um, that's come in. So like, we, I think we'd like to go through that. Maybe, again, I just want to maybe hammer home this point. Um, I don't want to be sound repetitive. But, you know, I think really, again, uh, Christian men really need to lead their family spiritually. And I think that, that's really where it starts in important. a sense. Um, uh, without that, um, I think, you know, again and i'm going to use some examples like if, mm. if, if a son is not seeing their father prioritize the local gathering of the church you know in terms of going to regular uh, service on a sunday morning or sunday evening uh, but he sees dad going to the gym five times a week and prioritizing rugby and bras with the friends and going away what is his son gonna see but dad i thought those are more important um you know so the reality is, again, it really starts that the father really needs to set the tone in the house uh, when it comes to spiritual matters. Again, do, do you pray with your children? Uh, do you go, do, do you go uh, to your children uh, and speak to them about spiritual matters regularly? Mm -hmm. uh, do you see uh, and look out for their well-being, both physically, of course, but also spiritually? Mm -hmm. um, so... You know, do you pray as a family? Uh, do you do devotional times uh, as a family? Um, and I think if, if we don't start there, then, you know, we're really um, not going to go anywhere. Uh, and there's not going to be any uh, progression in our manhood. Uh, and again, that's generally where women pick up the pieces in the family. So it really starts there. Um, and, I, and I really would you know, exhort men and again I, and I'm, we're not saying we're perfect we definitely are i know my life you know often fall short you know that passage from ephesians 5 especially you know, loving my wife like christ loves the church so I, I fall woefully short of that and again mm. you know um have to constantly repent about that and ask the lord to help me with that uh, but again i think we really need to prioritize our lives our family's lives mm. um when it comes to these matters. So maybe we can look at, I think a question has just come in and then we can yeah. you know, take it from there. Yeah, so uh, 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 thank you for the question, Enrique Davidson. Uh, I'll just get to it now. I just want to emphasize what Matt said. I think there's a, a weak understanding maybe today about what is family. You know, family is the smallest form of church. Do we realize that? The home, the Christian home is the full, smallest representation of the church. It functions like a church. That's how the, the, the reformers taught it. And, and if we have that picture of the home, then our evening devotions will take on another form, another priority. And the man is the head of that function, that elder. He's the elder of that small church. He's the one who needs to disciple his family. He's the one who needs to teach his family. He's the, need to want, he's, he's the one who need to lead, to lead them to kneel before the Lord in prayer. He's the one who take them to the Bible, teach and instruct them in the Bible. And if a father already begins there to play his role, his manhood will, will, will be learned by his daughters and by his boys. Um, and that's our role. That's important. Our home is a covenant unit 
we we must play our role. It's very important what you said there, Matt. So let's get back to Enrique's question. Yeah, Enrique had a very good question here. Yeah? Enrique Davidson, he said, good day, brothers. Could you maybe touch on how young men around my age, 18 to 20, who still live with their parents, can honor their parents? Does honoring your parents look different when you're, nine, when you're 19 years old than when you're 10 years old? Let me just say before uh, I give some of you a chance to jump in, they, I, I believe there's a general rule, and we've, we've, just, we've discussed the responsibility of men and young men to leave home soon and to start their own lives and, and not to become um, lazy, whatever, uh, as a general rule. But they are in our society, unfortunately. We've spoken about broken marriages uh, um, in, and so forth. Um, there are situations where sometimes young men stay with the single mother to help take care of the mother because she's now alone. Um, so we must be careful to overgeneralize. So there are situations where sometimes you find a young men, um, you know, uh, still at home at 19 or 18, 20, like Enrique is saying. But that is the exception. I think when you grew up in a healthy home, it will be good for this. And, and I think also, let me say also this, uh, in our modern society, sometimes you still study. It might so happen that while you study, you still stay at home. But I think there is a tendency, like we've touched on earlier, that young men are getting, uh, just there's no drive in them. They just stay at home. I don't know. <laughs> you know. Um, Mom does the cooking and washing. It's yeah. a good life. <laughs> It's, it's, it's just, just, this is just one comment. Look, this is something I don't understand. This is something new for me. Uh, I grew up when gap year didn't exist. <laughs> my gap year was get out of the house. Go and look, make fend for yourself. That was my gap year. I took my gap. <laughs> you know, so, the, the, but I, I don't, I don't yeah. speak now down to the whole concept yeah. of gap year, but I'm just saying there is yeah, a tendency I mean, to just sit back like longer yeah. and longer, you know, but anyway, yeah, just, guys, just point out, again, I, I don't think this is specifically a, a about, you know, this is the time you need to leave home specifically yeah. like, okay, when you, you know, 19 years and two months, you need to leave home. I think yeah. the point is where's the direction of the person going? And I, I think you made a good point. There are different examples. And I came from a broken home as well, single yeah. mom. Um, that could actually be the most mature and God honoring thing to do to, is to stay with your mom at that time. Exactly. But it, the, the question is, are you contributing to that household? Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you not acting like a man? Are mm. you, uh, or, or are you still acting like a 10 year old in terms yeah. of not doing uh, anything? Your mom's running around for you, et cetera. So again, it depends on the direction of the person's life mm. and where they, where they're going. Um, you know, what contribution are they making now as an 18 year old or a 19 year old or a 20 year old? Um, I know even for me, when I was at, I was, I, I, I started working quite young after, after school. Um, and at that stage, you know, while I was living with my mom, you know, even the small salary that I earned at the time, you know, I decided, you know, I wasn't even a believer then that I would give a portion to my mom. Mm. Uh, so again, can you contribute uh, financially to the household while you're at home or are you going to leech on your, your folks? So again, there's, there's many, again, as you said, nuances, but the point is, yeah, is, um, you know, what type of person are you being? What type of mm. man are you being uh, in these circumstances? I don't know if Colin, you want to maybe address the specific uh, question though. Yeah, just to add um, a little bit to that as well, because I think you've made a good point about like contributing to the household. And, and I think, you know, Back to your question, um, Enrique, when you're 10, I don't think it you expect a 10-year-old to contribute financially to the household. So yes, it, honoring your parents does look differently because when you're 10, you, you're meant to be a bit less independent and a bit more subservient to your parents than when you're 18 to 20. Um, you know, And I would say that there, when you're at that age, you show honor and respect to them by contributing more significant to the household financially, if you're working and able to, um, and in, in other areas as well, you know, looking after younger brothers and sisters so that you, you, if you're in a single parent household, so your mom can have a night off, um, you know, serving in other ways, you know, don't just expect your parents to do the dishes and the washing and all of that, but actually taking responsibility and providing support in the home for that. And then another um, really helpful thing um, is, 
you should still show esteem to them privately and publicly, even when you are, um, you know, no matter what age you're at. So, mm. so, you know, that's something that you can do to honor your parents. And then a third thing that, that often um, goes by the wayside when Christians become adults is seeking the wisdom of your parents. You know, um, the Bible has this constant theme of, you know, the foolishness of the youth and the wisdom of, of those who are older. And, you know, not all of us have, have believing parents, um, you know, but you can still, and, and Tim Challies actually has a really helpful article where he mentions this, but you can still seek out um, advice from your parents, whether you can or do heed their advice is another story, but, but to seek out that advice shows honor to the parents. So, um, you know, those are three areas I think we can still, you know, um, honor our parents in that way. But then, like Matt said, your direction should be moving towards um, independence, um, you know, standing on your own feet so that you can have a wife to love and support. And, mm. you know, you know, and again, I think, and again, just maybe to add there, I mean, I think, you know, for, for the Christian man, again, you... you even again in that in that example of maybe you have a single mom, the, the question is, in your mind, uh, you should again the, the maturity should, should already start developing that. You know, I actually want to get a good job so that I can actually maybe support my mom. You know, again, those or, or is the mindset well? You know what, mom's working, it's fine. I'll you now live or live here until I'm 25. And again, it's it's a, it's a mindset um, that I think many people have. It's it's a case of well. And again, I think that that's where childlessness um, comes into play. There's or childishness rather comes into play, where that there's no maturity in, 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 in many, you know, uh, boys. I should say that then they're, they're not actually taking those those necessary steps. Hmm. Guys, um, mm. we we ran out yeah. of time already, but I think that I would like to address <clears throat> Morris Morris Swartz's question. I think it's a very good question. So I think by way of education. Just being a bit of pra bit practical here, uh, and, and mm. especially in the church, let's uh, look at his question for the next five minutes and then we close. Uh, he says, many of us didn't have the ideal situation of having a father who raised us in the Lord. Uh, what are the best practical things we can do if things went wrong already? Uh, I want to address this in the church context, because, uh, and I want to ask, what should we do in the church? Because... In the church, we sit with many uh, broken homes, uh, young men without a father figure in his life, even in society. Um, uh, what can we do in church? What practical things can we do in church to come alongside these young men, these boys, as men, and then disciple them and train them up in biblical manhood? Some practical suggestions there. Colin, Matt, maybe? Yeah, I, I think that it's exactly right. I think this gets addressed best in a church mm. setting. And and I would say that what that person needs is to walk alongside other men, to have other mm. men, older men, disciple them, you know, have older men teach them. Um, you know, even like... I had what I would call an ideal situation, an almost ideal situation. You know, I grew up in a two-parent household. I, I love my parents. They've been amazing to me. Um, but it wasn't really, ex or it wasn't exactly a Christian household. Like, we didn't go to church. We didn't do any any of those kinds of things. And and I relied heavily when I got saved, and, and, and I'll openly say this, on Yaku. Like, Yaku and I met for coffee all the time. Uh, uh, Yaku mentored me in so many spiritual things um, and so i would say like practically do that men should get close to one another men should go and have coffee together bry together talk about spiritual things together i think another very practical thing is read books together you know um, and i think this especially as more, more mature christian men they, they should sometimes buy two of a book and give it to another man younger man and say look let's read this together i'll read my copy you read your copy and we meet once a month and chat about it mm -hmm. you know there, uh, there's such good material out there and i think that's a really easy practical thing to do that fosters that relationship and, and um 
that way men can disciple other men into the biblical manhood that is required. Yeah, I mean, I think just on, on the flip side, I mean, I, I grew up like you, like you in, a, in a broken home uh, in the sense that my, my folks got divorced at a very young age. By the mercy of God, uh, my mom was saved shortly after the divorce. And what, again, what's amazing, even though my mom actually uh, was saved uh, and she was an amazing uh, mother, she obviously tried to fulfill that father role, which she could never do. I mean, that's again, even it doesn't matter how godly the mother is, she still never truly fulfill that role. Um, so, you know, to be honest with you, I always had, even though I, I love my dad, I didn't have um, that, that figure to look up to. Uh, and, I, and I can see, even through my teenage years, it was something I desperately sought. I remember even being a teenager and, and even when I used to go to church and see, you know, godly men. It could, be a, it could be a youth pastor. It could have been a friend's father. Uh, you know, there was such a desire, you know, almost to get close to those people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think you know, Colin has really, uh, I think, uh, provided, you know, uh, pretty much what I would say in terms of feedback. Uh, all, all that I would add is, you know, again, I think we might have touched this in the beginning. Sadly, many older men, many, some older men in churches don't really take those steps uh, to seek out those opportunities to assist, you know, younger men. Uh, and again, what I would say from even personal experience is many younger men almost too afraid to take that step. Um, you know, it could be, they might be very vulnerable. Um they just don't want to almost embarrass themselves um, by being open and then being rejected in a sense. So uh, again, I think in a sense, the onus is on men, you know, mature men in, ch in, in the local church uh, to really look for opportunities to disciple mm -hmm. uh, men that come into to the local body. Yeah, I think one suggestion maybe from my side is also, I think the church needs to be very deliberate about this. It's, it's also not just going to happen automatically. We just know that. Um, so I think we need to make sure we know who is the, who is the young man in our church who, who grew up, who's busy growing up in a single home. And then, you know, deliberately ask senior men to, 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 to start reaching out to them, assign them to a, a uh, go and reach out to some senior, uh, senior men and say that 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 boy is your responsibility. Reach out to him regularly. Uh, you know, uh, ask him how he is. Get in life. Get in involved in his school life. Even go and watch some of his sport games or get some. Just get alongside him. Um, invite him for a coffee. You know, have soccer days at at a church where these young boys come and the, the men are. And you start reaching out, building the relationship. But you assign those young boys to to a, a senior man uh, man in the church which which uh, you know that that it will intentionally reach out and start working with them and then even your 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 men that's now ready 18 20 20 23 they are that age where they going to be married in a couple of years you know men who are married disciple them the church should be intentional disciple them even if they are I mean, obviously, they have fathers. The fathers can disciple them as well. But we should intentionally disciple men who go for marriage. And we should not just, uh, who are ready to, to go to that phase of being married. We should not just accept that they will be ready for marriage. We, we, we don't know the, what the gaps in their life is. And so I think we should create a network in the church where, where the men start looking out and more intentionally starting to disciple the boys and the young men in the church. To, to make them and grow them in biblical manhood. Guys, I think that's, that's all for tonight. We, we are again close to an hour. <laughs> we, we said initially we want to keep it a bit shorter. But any, anyway, thanks uh, everyone who, who joined us tonight for this topic. I think it's a very important topic and um, maybe we should uh, talk more about this in the future again. But I would encourage you in, in your own home, in your church, in your society, in your community, this is a topic that we really need to take on because, um, I mean, as we have even seen with this whole BLM movement breaking out and all these kind of things um, uh, uh, and all the cultural wars we have in society, often it's, 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 it's connected with absent fathers in the home, absent fathers in, in, in society, men leading in society, men taking the example in society, setting the example. 
um, and so forth. So I would encourage you to to to, to start uh, looking at this topic and and see how you can even in your own church uh, disciple other young men. Thank you for listening to us to this very important topic tonight. Just remember, uh, like our Facebook page, also go to our YouTube channel, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends and family and whoever you might find benefit from it. From it. Thank you, and we see you next week on Monday. Good night.